Coming up, we are going to talk about the best and worst changes ever made at Islands of Adventure from various locations in Central Florida. This is the Universal Edition of the Dis Unplugged. This is episode 270 of the Dis Unplugged Universal Edition. The Dis Unplugged Universal Edition is brought to you by Dreams Unlimited Travel, experts at helping you plan the perfect universal vacation. Visit them on the web at www.dreamsunlimitedtravel.com. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's episode of the Dis Unplugged Universal Edition. I am your host, Craig Williams, and today I'm joined alongside by my co-host, Rhino. Hello. How are you doing today? I'm okay. Okay. <laughs> Fantastic. I'm fine. You know what? Your honesty is appreciated. <laughs> I-, I find that the question, how are you, is just not one I want to hear anymore. Isn't that you know, a weird thing, you know? <laughs> I, I I do get that, and at the same time too, when it's coming from me, it's like not actually serious. I know. So, and on top of that too, we've been talking for about an hour now before <laughs> we even started recording. So we kind of got rid of all those pleasantries to yeah. begin with. So I don't know why we're even faking like we're having a conversation right now, but uh, that's the stuff that happens before we start rolling. It's the the big game of little. BTS there for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I don't know where I was going with that anyway. So uh, with, with that, we might as well cut to the topic today. And that is the best and worst changes made to attractions and, and such at Universal's Islands of Adventure through all of time. So we did this a while back and we broke it up into, I think, two or three episodes for the best and worst changes made for Universal Studios Florida. And in this case, we're going to knock it all out in one episode here for Islands of Adventure. And why is that? Well, it's that way because there actually hasn't been a lot of changes really made to this park since it opened. I mean, yeah, there's been upgrades to attractions. There has been attractions, obviously, removed. Uh, there's been ones closed down completely with no replacement as of this point. Uh, but it's, you know, the park with what it is, is pretty much the same park that it's been even since I've been going in 2000, 2011. And since Rhino probably first started going even earlier than that, like it's, it's a park that has remained relatively, uh, relatively the same in its entire life. And I think that's because it has, uh, you know, it has good bones when you have attractions like Mm Spider-Man, the incredible Hulk coaster and Jurassic Park River Adventure, the Toon Lagoon attractions. Like when you have all these solid attractions like that, you don't really need to go too crazy with uh, ripping stuff out and and putting new stuff in. And you know they've added here and there as time's gone on. But I think overall, it's a, it's a pretty solid park. Pretty solid. Yeah. It still feels. It still has that feeling of being fairly new, even though it's like twenty one years old. I feel like it. It doesn't feel like. I'm walking into this like super old theme park. Although I guess none of the theme parks really feel like that. So no. that's that's rude for me to say. Uh, I, guess. I, I I see, and I still see it in some areas. We talk about it, like Marvel Superhero Island. It there are aspects of it that do make it feel dated. I don't think the Incredible Hulk coaster and Spider Man necessarily feel dated at all. And they're great attractions. Uh, I think in the upgrades that have come to those attractions have helped it keep its its timeliness, but the the very uh, the the style of all of yeah. the superheroes in the island, even though it has been upgraded in such and certain areas, it just it still kind of feels stale. Toon Lagoon feels a little stale. Even I love Sue's Landing, but even that kind of has a a stale feeling to it when they the paint starts to really fade and it's it's not vibrant. Yeah, I mean, I, I was going to say the the Marvel area kind of reminds me a little bit of like uh, Six Flags. Yeah. But the way this, the appearance of how all the, it's it's a lot of like flat billboards of heroes everywhere. 
Exactly. No, it definitely uh, it's it does have that. It has that aesthetic to it a little bit, and it's okay because it is trying to also it has that flatness because it's trying to look like a comic book mm-hmm. in in that way. But at the same time, that is has not let it age uh, is is great as it probably could be, especially in a world of immersion. And the park's been kept fresh by then, you know, adding Skull Island, Reign of Kong. We're not talking about that on this list because it's in terms of, well, what's what's it replaced? What's it taken away? It was absolutely nothing. It was area that wasn't being used that maybe was one day going to be used for a Jurassic Park coaster or something else that then never happened. But they put Skull Island, Reign of Kong on there instead. And that's a great way to upgrade this park and keep it relevant without without really taking anything away. And then, obviously, we're getting the Jurassic Park, Jurassic World coaster anyways, and that's another situation where nothing nothing really has gone away to make that possible, except for uh, the one thing that we'll talk about on this list uh, as we get through it and such. But, yeah, it's, I just want to say that with, with all of this, it's the, the park is, is, I think, overall, it's just got, got good bones. Mm-hmm. It's got good footing on it. But there, there has been good changes made and good upgrades made and some bad ones as well, too. So we're going to go over all of them. And I'm going to start with, I think, is an easy, easy uh, softball to hit right off the bat here. And for the best changes and upgrades made to Islands of Adventure, I think one of the best things they have ever done was finally get rid of the eighth voyage of Sinbad and close it completely and now in this day and age that we're living in it's used as one of the relaxation uh, comfort stations where you're able to go and sit and take off your mask and i know you might be looking at me saying how is it better to have no show at all than than and just not have it than versus having it but uh, i did not care for this show one bit i only saw it once or twice and i just it was not very good. The actors, the stunt performers in it, all very good, very talented. Uh, but it just was not not a great show. I'm sure it was at some point in time, but uh, I it, it definitely to me screamed out as one of those experiences that having no show at all was better than potentially not knowing anything about it, walking into it and being like, what did I just watch? Yeah. Why did I just sit here through this? I could have been waiting in line for forbidden journey or something else instead of being here for this. And, and I experienced it. So I think, I think closing it and letting it just sit in limbo for the time being, and now being used as a relaxation spot. I think that's actually one of the better changes and decisions they tried to make because now one day when they do go to build something else in that spot, it's not like the, it's not, it's not going to hurt anyone's feelings. It's been sitting there dead for so long now. So my no feel no hard feelings anymore yeah they just wanted to let the 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 cut heal before they could they could do anything new but that it's it's what you it it was what you called a waste of time attraction uh that it would it, you know there's attractions you go on and you go oh that was fine that was good that was whatever but one that you come out and you're like wow i just wasted this much of my day to do this experience like it almost makes you upset you know, and so whereas if there was nothing there at all, you'd be like, hmm, whatever. <laughs> I don't know. It, it's a weird mentality. I, it's like, uh, what? what's the, they do all those surveys for a reason, you know? So clearly guest feedback got better when it closed, I guess, right? So <laughs> I, it, it may have. I'm not even sure. I know there's fans out there who loved Eighth Voyage of Sinbad, but... It, to me, it just, it was never anything, it was never anything amazing. And I'm sorry if we're offending you, but again, you know, it's, we're usually very critical on Universal's shows. Uh, we've obviously had very strong, harsh feelings uh, in towards Beetlejuice's Graveyard Review and Mashup, and I did not have great things to say about Born Stuntacular, so I don't think it's just shows in general, because there are theme park shows I like. I think it's just, it's never been one of the stronger suits with Universal, is yeah. their their shows, in a way. I think I think they're better at small street experiences, like Blues Brothers and... and, uh, and um, the so Celestina Warbeck in the Banshees and the uh, in the Puppet Show in Diagon Alley. I think those are all like really nice experiences. But in terms of big, large, grand shows, it's 
Universal, it's, I feel like it's not their strongest suit, but I think it was a good change. And then in terms of upgrades, we already mentioned them. I think two upgrades to attractions that actually made them uh, far superior than their previous versions was when The Amazing Adventures of Spider-Man went through their their upgrade in 2011, 2012, somewhere in there, and became completely uh, redone in 4K and got just just became pristine and mm. and looking better than ever and still continues to look fantastic. So I think that was a major, major upgrade that was definitely one of the best changes they made, as well as then when they redid Hulk a few years back and, and took the Q video and upgraded it, made it more uh, timely and relevant to to the look of what you would see from the Hulk right now versus the very 90s cartoon version of of the Incredible Hulk. And then also adding the Patrick Stump uh, composed theme music for the attraction and really making it a, a more full, well-rounded experience instead of just an outdoor coaster and really, you know, adding that extra element to it. I think both of those changes were really great upgrades and definitely helped helped improve the overall rideability of those attractions. Uh, Spider-Man didn't need it as much because it was still fantastic pre-4K upgrade, but you know, it just, it does feel more realistic now than it did before. And you're still riding around in a cartoon world, but just that stunning crisp 4k. It just, yeah. it feels real, man. There's so, it's something about the, like just the look of it that really pulls you in, but it's, it, so, but it's not like, yeah, it's like what you said. Like it's very clearly a cartoon. It's like its own Spider-Man aesthetic too, which I enjoy. It, it sets it, you know, cause uh, you could have the Spider-Man, from the 90s which was the show i watched as a kid and that i that's what i always felt like this attraction was kind of based on and then when it went into the 4k it was kind of like its own visual representation of it but it it definitely i this it, it fits that surrounding like the blend of the physical to the animated parts like works so well i don't know if it I, I loved it when it was the regular version but i just i love this this newer version too because i do feel like 3d shows can get can get dated really quickly you can all of a sudden be like i can't believe i used to think this was like 3d or whatever but it's still i think about that part where doc octopus comes through the wall and the bricks are kind of like flying at you i always think that part looks so good yeah i think they're definitely with 3d shows there was a time where like where it especially with using uh cg graphics and stuff i feel like it it probably looked great at that point in time, but then it didn't age as well. So even looking at it from over like it, uh, at Walt Disney World, like I think that even though Muppet Vision 3D is is far older than it's tough to be a bug. Something about I watched both of those two within days back to back of each other uh, recently and Muppet Vision actually looked better all around than It's Tough to Be a Bug did. And I st- I think Muppet Vision also looks better than Filler Magic does. And it's just those little, couple little, uh, that that time frame there in the late 90s, 2000s, that where you're, you're using all these CG animated styles in these 3D movies, and but it feels incredibly dated to that time and it maybe didn't age as well, whereas some older, older 3D for some reason still... It looks better maybe because of different technology and you know it's sometimes sometimes we upgrade technology not for the better yeah but i don't believe anyone would actually feel that way too but i i see where you're coming from with it so i'm on i'm on team rhino with this <laughs> uh, hulk i can't really speak too much of i only wrote it after it was updated that one time and that was more than enough times for me to write it but i understand why people love it i thought the queue was really cool when i went into it it is. No, it's uh, it, definitely good changes made. I like just the overall aesthetic. It went from feeling, it just felt old and dated, and just you know, paint and some changes to the pre-show just made it made it new, made yeah. it made it uh, made it more interesting all over again. So good, good changes on that. So uh, much like the first uh, one we talked about, Eighth Voyage of Sinbad. Just completely closing. Uh, another really positive change where nothing came from it is uh, basically the the Toon Toon Lagoon Theater as it stands today. 
pretty much used for nothing, special events. Uh, Potter was there before, but what came there before was a, a series of different things, including Matt Hoffman's freaking crazy stunt show. And that was the first iteration of Matt Hoffman's bikes show happening on that stage. And then also uh, Matt Hoffman's Agro Circus, which was around when I was going to Universal seasonally a couple times, which always just made me scratch my head about. But yeah, those were those were two uh, two attraction shows that were on the Toon Lagoon Theater uh, before before it's been basically used for nothing. That I feel like uh, I feel like it's it's for the better that those shows aren't in there anymore. But one other show that I had never known about that was apparently on the stage back in '99, like when it first opened and closed sometime after that there's basically no footage of it anywhere but found like one small 30 second clip of it without the real music but just to see the show but it was the pandemonium cartoon circus which was just wild watching like the the short little clip of it and we'll have links to that in the show notes so you can see it yourself if you didn't but uh all three of those those different shows happening on the stage together i am so glad that they are they are all gone and this is just used for nothing anymore. I would be interested in the circus thing. Like that thing just seems so bizarre. I, I could wait, maybe wait, get behind wait, which the Toon Circus or the other one? The Toon Circus, yeah. Okay, because I was like the other one just the video annoyed me. So I don't know. Like Oh, Agro Circus? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, that yeah, the the Pandemonium Circus with the Universal like with the Toon Lagoon characters on stage and Woody Woodpecker and all those. Like that that just watching the 90 seconds of that show that was on YouTube to get a feel for what it was, I'd be interested in that. Uh it would not just looking at it visually, it would not be around today still. It would be so incredibly dated that they would have had to get rid of it a long time ago. But in terms of Matt Hoffman's freaking crazy stunt show and the Matt Hoffman's agro circus, I just I, I never understood why there was bike stunt shows happening in the park. Like I hated Tarzan Rocks over at Animal Kingdom when that existed, which was essentially, you know, rollerbladers doing stunts and stuff. And I know this was in the age of the X I was gonna games. say, yeah, it was it was that extreme sport time because you had that. It was like that area right around like 2002 to like i don't know when it's kind of died down like 2005 because you had extremely goofy movie i know like two seasons of the power rangers had extreme sports was a very like main part of the storyline and i was just like oh my god enough with these tiny bicycles like yeah and i here's the thing i love I loved watching BMX. I loved watching skateboarding. Like I loved the X Games at that point in time. I mean, I would when my dad and I would go to Colorado, we would watch, we would watch uh, snowboarding there and watch professionals do the half pipe and stuff. Like so, it's not. This was what I was living, but seeing it in a theme park is just so strange. It's so shoehorned when you take something like that and just. Put it in. That's where I get you. You mentioned Six Flags before. To me, yeah. that is Six Flags Entertainment right there. It well, even then, I feel like it, well, I, that's why I said it was very. It's a very. It reminds me of a sort of a, you know, like you'd find the VHS tape of being like, oh, my parents brought me to this one circus that kind of showed up, you know, three towns over, and they had this one area. It, like, when I look at the video, I'm like, I wonder if it smells like animal feces in there, like it does at a regular, one of these terrible experiences we went to as a kid or something, like a fair or something like that, you know, and it, Lord knows if that even was animal feces, if that was the smell, but you know what I mean? And I was, the craziest part about that video that I watched, though, is that the bike is so close to where everyone is sitting. Like, they're just roped off, and there's a dirt bike that rides up onto the stage, and I'm like, I, after working at Lights Motors Action for so long, you know, and I've seen a couple of accidents that I just, like, what was the insurance on this show? Like, the, the, <laughs> the guy who stands in the circle, who I'm assuming is Matt Hoffman, I don't know. Uh, also, I was just like, it doesn't take, I know these are professionals, and you say, oh, accidents never happen, blah, blah, blah. But it's a theme park. You know what I mean? It, it just it, it's one of those where I watch it and I'm like, this is not something I would have enjoyed. This is something I feel like you could see other places in the country and in the world, you know, whereas like when you're at a theme park like Universal Studios, there's so much that you're not going to get anywhere else in the world. 
that why would I go see something like this right right then? You know, yeah, I don't know. I, I, it's just one of those things. I'm sure, I'm sure there are people out there who are screaming saying, "No, this was amazing! I never, I never had the chance to see." performers like this up close before except for universal and so i i get that but i I, to me it's just a real head scratcher especially at the toon lagoon theater but none nonetheless like a a place where it does it doesn't even slightly fit at all i i just i i I like i'm not yeah i'm not denying that the people in the show aren't talented and that the, the the people who are riding the dirt bikes around inside of the circle that that doesn't look really cool it's just one of those where you're like who signed this contract in here? Who was like, we need some entertainment. We've got a couple of people that are part of this like traveling circus. Let's write a story around this, right? Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, wild, wild times there. But another positive change. This is going to be one that hurts to say, but we've said it multiple times before. Uh, a positive change, of course, was Dragon Challenge being removed to make way for Hagrid's Magical Creatures Motorbike Adventure. And it's tough, but I mean, honestly, it's true. It's two, two rough but awesome inverted roller coasters that that w- I feel like they weren't. They could have lasted another twenty years, and it still would have felt fresh and and still still really great roller coasters because that's what they were. But ultimately, what we got from it is a, a more family friendly roller coaster that is fast paced but also then doesn't have the height elements, doesn't have the looping for people who don't necessarily care for that. You know, you can still get that over at Incredible Hulk Coaster. We're going to have plenty of that at the new Jurassic Coaster that's coming. So it's like, it's kind of filled the gaps in, but uh, it, for that time period, yeah, we were left without without the excitement of Dragon Challenge. I feel like that's that's been fixed in the long run, but you can't, you can't argue against Hagrid's. It's it's really solid roller coaster, and it's it's a ton of fun, and it's it's different. So yeah, well, it's, like, it's, it's a good like, change. It's kind of what you said, like it, it, it not to there's no like pun intended, but it it, it has a more universal appeal because everybody can. It, it's a ride that more people across you know different spectrums can get on to the attraction and and experience it and have fun. And I feel like it tells a much clearer story that is you know it it fits where it belongs better and and it's it's original in terms of i'm not saying that dragon challenge wasn't original but dragon challenge i think was like a rack roller coaster right like it wasn't no it was i mean it's it was designed a lot of those inverted coasters all felt the same and but the fact that it was also a dueling roller coaster yeah which i just like kind of cross over into that right now too but like it's on the worst changes even though Dragon Challenge doesn't exist anymore, but it w- I'd honestly say that one of the worst changes they made was changing Dueling Dragons into Dragon Challenge. They had to for the Wizarding World and to to make it all fit. But honestly, they took the they took what was an even more interesting roller coaster when it was Dueling, and the queue was so much darker and disturbing, and just just it, it was it was a it was better themed overall. And then when it changes to, to dragon challenge, they strip away a lot of that theming Add all, keep basically all of the queue, the exact same as it was just add some Potter in, take away a lot of the darker elements and some of the things that made the queue even more interesting. And that's kind of, then you have it. That's, that's dragon challenge. And you had doling continue on for a while until a couple of the incidents and then that's gone so even though it's not fair it's not like oh well you know it's dragon challenge is the reason why they got rid of dueling is because it made no sense anymore that's not the case at all because it did duel for years until they they had to take it away but it was part of the slow digression down of dragon challenge from when it used to be greater back as dueling dragons so that's definitely a a negative change is dueling dragons going to dragon challenge but then then just fixing it up with hagrid's it's it was much better than what was shoehorned in there to begin with because you know, even like just everything about Dueling Dragons, even though I wasn't able to see it in person, but I I feel like I've lived enough through the photos I've seen of it, yeah. the shots I've seen of it, and uh, bring it on in order to in it to win it. Is that the one that it is? <laughs> That's your remember. favorite one, yeah. Uh, they do the Dueling Dragon. 
That's, yeah, that's the move. So I feel like I feel like I've known enough of it from from that, and then obviously my my time spent at Dragon Challenge that I know I I knew those coasters inside and outside. So it's uh you know good good changes and bad changes all in there. But uh, another good change was overall to that entire area was when they they took merlin wood that was part of the lost continent and did change it into the wizarding world of harry potter uh unfortunately from the photos i have seen of it merlin wood was arguably the coolest part of that entire area maybe you know it's i i love the lost continent the look of the lost continent i don't love a lot of the stuff in it but i love the overall aesthetic especially with poseidon's fury area like i really do love that but I think Merlinwood from the photos I've seen, like the Enchanted Oak Tavern that was there, like that stuff looked really cool. But I mean, the Wizarding World of Harry Potter took took Universal to the next level. So even though they they had to reuse aspects like Dueling Dragons for Dragon Challenge and the, unicorn the Flying line, Unicorn right? yeah. for um, for uh, Hippogriff, call it Flight of the Hippogriff. Yes. Uh, even though they had to reuse those elements, I mean, overall, what we still got with Hogsmeade, I mean, that's it kind of set off the revolution for the future of of Universal and, and even the immersive theme parks for a whole. So I can't I can't really argue with it. A cool area before, but definitely plussed. Yeah, th- I mean, there's no. Qu- I'm looking at the photo because you brought it up about the oak because I saw it written somewhere, but I was like, oh, I don't think I've ever seen a picture of it. The oak tavern thing is yeah. cool but i mean yeah there's no question that harry potter is the that hogs me just the i was gonna say the you know with hagrid's you, you, it changed that landscape over there so much more and it feels so it, it gives it that like really kind of like ruins look but it, it just fits so well and it looks so cool like even if you don't do the attractions over there i'm still like it looks great but then also i mean um forbidden journey is like one of the best theme park attractions ever right yeah so but i feel like there's no way that wasn't a plus i completely agree with it so but unfortunately that's it for our best changes now we're going to move on to the worst changes and upgrades Mm. that have been made over time and we're gonna jump right into it in jurassic jurassic park and the the first change that i think was one of the worst changes they made was the old uh, triceratop encounter discovery trail whichever one you want to call it depending on what time it was running but you know that eventually just stopped being used and sat dormant a lot of urban explorers that would like to sneak backstage in theme parks they would go into this area and see the the triceratops still just there not being used at all and then eventually part of it got reused for the queue for uh for the raptor encounter before it shifted its position and moved around and you know this area this whole landscape now has changed because of the jurassic park world coaster coming in so it's you know it's a weird it's been a weird journey for this area but uh, I it's one of those things that I always scratch my head about because we'd get so excited while I was working at Universal when we'd find out like over the radio like oh Triceratops actually opening for the day like how how unique how crazy and it was just you know is a simple little walkthrough show but it's just it added to that element of like in Jurassic Park like this is dinosaurs are real dinosaurs are yeah. alive so to just to just kind of shudder it just it uh, always kind of bothered me a little bit didn't feel like it was justified well it was it like because that and then there if that wouldn't be around and then you know uh raptor encounter still fairly new that it, it, it you know there were no dinosaurs so other yeah. than the river adventure, you didn't have an opportunity. So if you weren't going to go on this like drop ride, you know, or a ride, you know, whatever the flume ride, um, y- you know, you didn't ever get the chance to see a dinosaur really other than like the, the, you know, the skeletons inside a discovery center. But it, so I, when I was watching the video of the Triceratops area, I was like, this idea is really interesting. Like, even if the show is not executed as well as it could be, I felt like it was maybe like too long, a little too long. Yeah. But I wish they had done something 
where there was more of that, where there's like, you know, more of a, a of kind of a, that zoo element that is what the movie and the book are really about. And so like turn it into, I, I don't know what other dinosaurs you could do, but I imagine you'd be able to walk through and see more of them or do some more effects and stuff. So it was a, it was a shame. Uh, it's cause you did bring up a good point there. I mean, besides a couple of dinosaurs that they have just like randomly positioned, it's if you didn't do river adventure, you're kind of out of luck. I mean, disco, yeah. you do have the fossils and then you have, when there's a team member there, they can birth the uh, the mm-hmm. Velociraptor. Push, 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 little one. But yeah, other than that, it's kind of, you needed something like this to bring the dinosaurs to the people that weren't able to get it in the other ways. So uh, I thought, I, I still think that that was a, a huge, huge loss for it. But you know what? The, Feel the, free to disagree with me. Well, the Triceratops, I think, look great. I, yep. It was big. It was this cool, like animatronic. Like I, I don't know. I wish there was more. I, I wish there had been more of a push for that. And who knows? Maybe we'll get that in the future. But or maybe, maybe, not, I don't know. maybe. But another bad change in this one. I definitely was never around to experience, so I apologize for it. It might have been terrible. But the island skipper tours, the the boat launch that went from from port of entry back into the park, I believe, back to the Jurassic Park area, like that. I, that to me is something that when I first started going to Islands of Adventure and Universal, I did not know that it existed at one point in time. And then, you know, you kind of think to yourself, like you have this big open water. Why yeah. isn't there boats running around with it? And then coming to find out, you know, I think it was like a year later then I found out like, oh, actually there was for a very short time in the beginning. And then it just it costs too much to upkeep and and such so that's why they got rid of it but like i i feel like this is something that still needs to happen on that water they need they need something out there moving around to to just keep that up and honestly to help make port of entry even make more sense as a port of entry well yeah yeah (laughs) because that doesn't that i guess that aspect of it until you just kind of said that i was like hmm yeah like there you're not going any i guess you're entering the world but I, I it just see, it's crazy to me because it is such a large body of water, and I always thought like, oh, wouldn't it be cool if you could go up the Jurassic Park like if you were arriving through Jurassic Park that way or like, I but it's just it's also like, you you know you want families of all ages and generations to experience your park. I feel like my grandparents love a good boat boat attraction that would have been a good one that they would have done or my stepdad even he just likes to ride the boats back and forth so he would have enjoyed that. Oh yeah, so, it's kind of a bummer. Everyone enjoys a good boat ride. It doesn't have to go anywhere in particular. It could literally just go around in a circle. I would get on something that would literally take me in a circle of that area and be like, okay, look off to your right. You can see the sneeches on the beach there. And yeah. there, that's that's Seuss oh, Landing. And then, oh. What if they put that dinosaur from Jurassic World in the water? <laughs> and then so <laughs> like when scary. you got to Jurassic World, you could kind of see that. And like, you know, that that would be neat. Yeah. It would be neat. I think it's something that still uh, they need something for the water. I just I, I I will continue to say that over and over again. But those are really the only worst changes that I could think of with that. We already mentioned doling dragons going into dragon challenge and the sadness of Merlinwood and and Enchanted Oak and all of that. So don't need to bring that up again. And then for the rest. Uh, the only one in the rest, and that was the the change of Poseidon's Fury into Poseidon's Fury. And <laughs> that, of course, is that the original Poseidon's Fury was different than the Poseidon's Fury that we have today. It was a complete different storyline. You had the Keeper was your your guide on this story who was talking about Atlantis and the epic battle between Zeus and Poseidon and... You know, then you you see Poseidon, who's an evil, angry god and wants to keep you there completely. But, well, lucky for us that the Keeper is actually Zeus and they're going to they're going to fight in an all out battle to hopefully save us. And uh, it's uh, I'll again have the link to the video of it (laughs) so you can watch it yourself if you didn't have the chance to experience it like I did not. Uh, It was definitely a trip watching it. And. Uh, the reason was I never had bothered watching it before, I think, or all the way through. So I'm watching that old show, 
and comparing it to the new one where instead of the keeper Zeus, you have Taylor, of course, taking you on the tour and then Darkanon captures you and then Poseidon has to come to to save the day and rescue us all. Like I I was watching that old one and thinking about what Poseidon's Fury is today, even though it's not currently open, temporarily closed. I'm like, I'm not sure that one is actually better than the other. Maybe, maybe that first version was really bad when it was around, and then when they redid it, it was a visible upgrade to it. But I feel like now in 2020, mm. Poseidon's Fury as it's as it would stand today is just as goofy as that original version was. So I'm not sure if it was a good change or a bad change, but it was an interesting change. That's it for was sure. a change. Yeah. <laughs> I it's weird because it's like I, I can imagine somebody sitting in a room and like the the meeting where they came up with this really cool conceptual idea and it just seems like it's never quite right. You know, it's like some of it's cool, but it like the ending, like the crumbling building and stuff like seems like that would look really cool. But then when you experience it, you're like, this doesn't look very good. Like, but then it's so I don't know. It's one of those things where I'm like, this seems like this is an idea that was so close to being great, but they just keep making these weird stories around it. So who knows? Maybe we'll get another evolution of it. It'll be like a Pokemon. Yeah, maybe, maybe. But uh, that's uh, that's kind of it. So that's. That's actually where this ends our our journey here through the best and worst changes made at at Islands of Adventure. So if I missed something that I didn't know existed and was removed, obviously please let us know in the comments or or scream it out to us somewhere because I'm that's just you know this is what I could find based on websites, Wikipedia, all that, putting together all the different changes that have been made throughout time uh, to that park. And I'm, I'm sure there's stuff that has fallen through the gaps there as well, too. So if we did miss anything, please let me know, because I would love to to update about it on a on a future episode. But other than that, that's it. That's, that's the adventure for today. Oh, good Ooh. one. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, uh, of course, uh, we we appreciate you all out there for listening and watching this. If you are watching this on YouTube, please take the time to subscribe to our channel and then hit the bell button if you haven't. So that way you get notified anytime we have new Dis Unplugged videos. And then please leave us comments below. Let us know what your list would be in terms of the best and worst changes made at Universal and Islands of Adventure. If you you want to catch up from the last episodes we did on it, uh, leave, us all, uh, leave us your opinions on it and tell us where we're wrong and which ones we're right on. And then, of course, also leave us questions that we'll compile for an upcoming question and answer episode eventually here. And hit that thumbs up button. That always helps, too. And if you're listening to this on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, uh, it, Make sure you're subscribed to us as well, too, and leaving us ratings and reviews. So that way it helps more people end up finding the show. So if you haven't taken the time to to rate us on, on Apple Podcasts yet, please do so. Don't even have to give the feedback. Just leave us a star rating. That always Just helps. Star. Just a star. Well, no, don't leave us one star. Preferably <laughs> five stars. I'm okay with four stars. If it's three stars because you're like, the co-hosts are kind of annoying. They just tell jokes to each other. You know what? Just don't Can bother. Just, yeah. yeah, yeah. Three and a half or bust. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, preferably four or five. I'll accept four. I'll accept four for our flaws. So, uh, but yeah, that's that is that. So, and again, uh, if you are planning an upcoming trip to Universal or the Orlando area, and you you want that extra help. There's always dreamsunlimitedtravel.com available with great agents who can help you plan the perfect universal vacation. So please think about checking them out if if you enjoyed this. So I don't think I have anything else to say besides uh, if you, you want to reach out to me further to ask questions or talk, uh, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Teleclaster. And Rhino, what about for you? Um, through the Pony Express, you'll find me. Um, no, I, I, Twitter and Instagram is Rhino R Y N O one one eight five. Very good. So that's going to do it for this episode. We'll see you again next week with another episode of the Dis Unplugged Universal Edition. But until then, remember we still haven't changed the name. <laughs> <laughs>